welcome to the shop. This is the second part of a two-part review of my 2008 Honda Goldwing. In part one, I went over the bike's features and other things I've noticed after two plus years and 20,000 kilometers. In this video, I'll talk about the riding and ownership experience. At the end of this video, I'll summarize all the pros and cons I mentioned in both episodes. Before I start part two, I have an update from part one. I mentioned in that video that I might have OEM hand grips under my ISO grips, and it turns out I did. The smaller diameter OEM grips feel much better for my hands. I'll likely notice more difference from the grip heaters, and I'm looking forward to trying them out in the spring. So now, on with part two. At first, the sheer weight of a Goldwing was a downside for me, and maneuvering it at low speeds was daunting. I'm smaller than the average rider, and this is my first big touring bike. When I dropped this one a couple of times after four weeks of riding it, I began to think that maybe it's just too big for me. But I eventually learned that dropping your gold wing happens to most riders and that I could overcome this concern by developing the needed low speed skills. I routinely practice those and as I improve, the bike keeps feeling smaller and I no longer feel like it's too big for me. I made a separate video about that experience. One thing that helps is that the seat is low, and even though the bike is wide, I can easily put both feet flat on the ground. This bike is surprisingly easy to lift onto its center stand, even though it's very heavy. Honda got the geometry of the stand right. You just put the ball of your foot on the stand pad, grab a side handle and the handlebar, and lift while you extend your leg, and it's up. The 1832cc engine is possibly the best thing about this machine that has so many good features. It has more than enough power and torque to make this heavy bike very quick to get moving and fun at any reasonable speed. I've roughly timed the acceleration and it can go from 0 to 100 kph in 4-ish seconds. That's a respectable number for a 15 year old 900 pound motorcycle. The engine starts readily, no matter whether it's been sitting for hours or weeks. It's surprisingly quiet in a mechanical sense, considering there are 12 valves and 6 pistons dancing around beside your feet. As for the exhaust note, it's music to my ears. It has a deep rumble when idling and it sounds like an exotic sports car at higher revs. I've heard the 2018 and newer Goldwing engine is even better than this one, but I wouldn't have thought there was much you could improve. Vibration can cause fatigue on longer rides. The buzzing of a motorcycle engine becomes very noticeable after sitting with your legs wrapped around one for hours. The boxer engine in the GL is so smooth that you don't even think about vibration. It does have a noticeable buzz in the handlebars, foot pegs and seat at around 5000 RPM, but every mechanical system has a resonant frequency and this engine is as smooth as glass at normal cruising speeds. The 5 speed transmission has shown none of the issues like so called ghost shifting that a small few of these bikes have. Because it's such a big bike with a heavy drivetrain, changing gears makes an audible clunk that you can feel through the shifter. Mine has an aftermarket heel toe shifter which takes less effort than upshifting with just my toe. Following the advice of Paul Short, a very credible mechanic on YouTube. I switched from Honda GN4 engine oil to synthetic about a year ago and it made a surprising improvement in how smoothly and quietly this transmission shifts. I would recommend a quality synthetic oil and Paul's channel to anyone having a GL1800 of this vintage. 
I find this bike seems to shift most smoothly at around 3000 RPM. Whether these bikes should have had a sixth gear is a hotly debated topic, but I have no complaints about the gear ratios, because fewer gears and a very flat torque curve mean less shifting on slower roads. This engine seems perfectly happy at highway speeds, and Goldwings are known for covering hundreds of thousands of kilometers with almost bulletproof reliability, so they're obviously made to take it. But I would still probably appreciate taller gearing if most of my riding was on highways, so I can see both sides of this issue. The speedometer reads faster than a GPS by at least 5%. From what I can tell, this is the case for most Honda motorcycles these days. I assume that means the odometer also reads higher than actual, and if so, you get fewer miles of warranty coverage on a new bike. As for handling, it's almost hard to believe how sporty this enormous bike feels on a twisty road. The low center of gravity resulting from features like the boxer engine and the underseat fuel tank make the bike much more easy to lean than its looks would imply. And thanks to the sturdy box aluminum frame, it feels solid and predictable in the corners. I'm not saying I could stay ahead of a sport bike on a crooked road, but it's a heck of a lot of fun in the curves anyway. It seems to defy logic that such a big bike can feel this sporty, and I doubt anyone would believe it until they've ridden one. The brakes have been ample for any situation I've encountered. With a three piston caliper on each of the front rotors and on the single rear rotor, these brakes offer impressive stopping power. But any bike that weighs more than 900 pounds needs a heavy anchor. I've only ever noticed the ABS engaging one time when I was stopping on a road with sand on the asphalt and it worked flawlessly. The link front and back brakes are very responsive and almost effortless to operate. These link brakes, paired with anti-dive front suspension, make the bike feel very stable under braking. Brake wear hasn't been an issue for me so far. I did replace the rear pads at about 90,000 kilometers, but they still look almost new some 7,000 kilometers later. The aftermarket front brake rotor covers are a nice touch, and they do a good job of keeping dirt off the brakes. However, they make it difficult to get a good look at the condition of the brake pads. So I check them by sticking my phone in there and snapping a photo. In my opinion, the suspension is adequate, but not great. On normal road conditions, it's like floating on a cloud, and there's nothing I can complain about. However, it seems harsh when it encounters a bump of any significant size. It's not bottoming out on the bumps, but it does send a jolt through the handlebars and seats. The rear suspension preload is adjustable in settings from 1 to 20. I usually run it at 5 when I'm alone and 16 with my wife, who finds the ride too harsh at higher settings. I like the lower seat height when I turn it down to 5, and although it makes a softer ride, it doesn't bottom out. I guess because I weigh all of 70 kilograms. There are plenty of suspension upgrades, such as better springs, that I could install to improve the ride. The ultimate upgrade would be a full package such as that offered by Traxian Dynamics, but I just can't justify that cost for this older bike and the amount of riding I do. This bike has more than enough storage capacity for our use. The trunk holds both of our full face helmets and the saddlebags have plenty of room for everything else we'd want to carry. The saddlebag doors open slowly on dampers. There's a bit of a trick to closing them so they latch fully. I use two hands to firmly and gently latch them because they can appear closed when the dash indicates they're still open. Of course, it has a key fob, like most cars have, for remote locking and unlocking of the saddlebags and trunk, as well as unlatching the trunk. 
all of that works as it should and I use it surprisingly often. The front and rear glove boxes are quite useful. I keep the bike's papers in the lockable box and I have room in the other for sunglasses, a kickstand and if I want, a device connected to the USB power outlet that I added. USB ports weren't really a thing when this bike was built. I added a couple of outlets so we could charge our phones and Bluetooth headsets. I put one in the front left glove box that's switched by the ignition key and I installed another outlet in the trunk that's powered directly from the battery so we can charge devices when we're away from the bike. This outlet has its own power switch so it won't drain the battery when not in use. I also installed a small LED light in the trunk as mine had no factory lighting. This little light is ideal. The battery lasts for weeks and it can be charged in my trunk USB port. It has a motion sensor so it automatically comes on when I open the trunk and it attaches with a magnet so it can also be used as a flashlight. I tracked my gas mileage for the first couple of months I had the bike and I got an average of 6.1 liters per 100 kilometers or 39 miles per US gallon. At a guess that was about 25% highway and 75% on secondary roads or in urban areas. Probably about half of those miles were two up with my wife. Based on those numbers, this bike should get about 400 kilometers from a 25 liter fill up. The owner's manual recommends fuel with an octane rating of 86 or higher, so I can use any grade available in my area. Gasoline sold in my part of the world can contain up to 10% ethanol, but I haven't experienced any issues using it so far. Aside from the positive battery cable working loose a couple of times, this bike has been 100% reliable. So far, I've been able to do all of my own maintenance. Changing the air filter on a Goldwing is a notorious amount of work because so many parts need to be removed first. I usually need a day for it because I do some cleaning and other maintenance while I have it apart. And as you can see from this shot, I have a fork seal replacement job to do. I'll change the air filter at the same time and I'll make a video about that project. This bike had new Bridgestone Excedra tires when I bought it. I replaced the rear after about 15,000 kilometers and after 20,000 kilometers, the front still has some life left. I run the rear at 41 pounds per square inch and the front at around 38. Based on my annual mileage, I expect I'll need a new rear tire every year and a new front tire every two to three years. I installed an aftermarket tire pressure monitoring system in 2021, mainly for peace of mind. It's not perfectly accurate, but it will at least let me know if I have a slow leak or a sudden loss of tire pressure, and that's worth the price. It might be difficult to believe, but this bike is quite easy to keep clean. The parts that would be harder to clean on naked bikes, like the engine, are mostly hidden behind smooth plastic. So far, I've only had to wash this bike about once a year. And after I wash it, I cover most surfaces with SC1 silicone spray, which sparkles for weeks and makes it very easy to wipe away dirt or bugs with a soft cloth. After any ride of moderate distance, there will be a layer of dust down low on the saddlebags and rear fender, no matter what kind of road I've been on. I can wipe down the entire bike in about 10 minutes and it will look like it has just been washed. To summarize, here is a list of the pros and cons I see with this bike. So as you can see, I do have a few quibbles, but those are far outweighed by all the pluses. 
I'd recommend a gold bling of this vintage to anyone who's looking for a reliable, affordable touring bike. If it has been well maintained and has reasonably low mileage, it should have many years of good life left. So I hope you found this review helpful. If you haven't yet watched part one, please check it out. And then if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment. And of course, please subscribe. Thanks for watching.